For the second year in a row, COVID-19 dominated the headlines in Thunder Bay. But there were other major events as well, such as the federal election, new railcar contracts for Alstom, and some heated debates at City Hall. Stay with us as over the next hour we recap the top stories of 2021. I'm Catalina Gillies and thank you for watching TBT News Year in Review. The month of January saw the continued rollout of first dose vaccinations in hopes of countering the next wave of the pandemic. By end of day, we should have completed approximately 600 vaccine doses. CEO Rhonda Crocker Ellicott adds the hospital will run out of its current supply this week. And while there are two additional shipments expected later this month, there will likely be a gap between when the current supply runs out and new doses come in. We will have completed all first doses available by Wednesday, Thursday of this week. Um, we're looking forward to receiving additional shipments uh, through the latter part of January. Hospitals across the province continue to push for faster delivery. The regional is also awaiting word on whether the Pfizer vaccine can be moved off site and perhaps administered at another larger location. Crocker Ellicott says with that okay and the needed supply, the hospital could administer about a thousand vaccinations a day. Also in January, a damning report was released by the province regarding the deadly COVID outbreak at the Southbridge Roseview long-term care home that claimed 21 lives. And an inspector confirmed PPE not being worn into residents' rooms and wearing the same PPE in multiple residents' rooms. Halu Shack says she feels like one of the lucky ones as her mother has not tested positive. But she's angry for those families who have lost someone. To read this report and think even for a second that perhaps their loved one's lives could have been saved if Roseview had had better infection prevention and control protocols in place. The inspector came in the report. She identified some areas that she felt needed improvement and were addressing those areas. Meanwhile, some small business owners began protesting the province-wide lockdown. And Mayor Bill Morrow expressed concerns about the emotional damage the restrictions were causing to local citizens. It's been four weeks since all of Ontario fell subject to a province-wide lockdown, followed by a stay-at-home order in the wake of rising cases of COVID-19 across the province. Small businesses remain closed, restaurants remain open only for takeout and delivery, and Thunder Bay Mayor Bill Morrow knows some residents are reaching a breaking point. I'm worried. Uh, there's fatigue. People are really being uh, feeling uh, a lot of anxiety related to the situation that we're in. It's different than when it was in the summer. Uh, we're still in the middle of winter, so obviously we're very concerned. And the community's frustration seemed to hit a breaking point after one particular measure in late January, the removal of hockey nets from local outdoor rinks. There were passionate arguments made late on Monday night from city councillors on both sides of the issue. These rules are becoming very arbitrary and nonsensical. I, as a councillor, cannot say, well, we're just going to put the nets back and we'll see what happens. What happens may not be all that good. The city's parks manager insists the hockey nets were removed from outdoor rinks on Thursday at the direction of the health unit. It was my understanding as of January 20th that the health unit required us to remove the nets in order to address the reports of non-compliance. But Mayor Bill Morrow, who led the charge to put the nets back, says he's heard otherwise. There is conflicting messages when it comes directly to me, okay, uh, in terms of what may or may not have been said by the health unit. The nets were put back in early February, but by that time the focus had shifted to the outbreaks at the Thunder Bay Jail and Correctional Centre, where inmates were being released and then spreading COVID to the broader community. Mayor Bill Morrow says the decision to declare a second state of emergency was based on the need for financial and staffing assistance at isolation shelters for those who have tested positive for COVID. Isolation shelters are hotel-based and mainly used for individuals being released from custody who may not have anywhere to stay. 
With ongoing outbreaks at the district jail and correctional centre, the isolation shelters are being stretched thin. The, the isolation capacity that, that we have now is maxed out or is very close to being maxed out. So we need both staff as we expand isolation uh, and we need the financial resources to operate it as well. And so it was recommended to me that through this method, we could potentially get assistance from the provincial government to provide increased capacity for isolation. Despite the rise in cases, there was a brief time of celebration in mid-February as the province went ahead with a partial removal of lockdown measures. The lockdown went into effect in Thunder Bay on Boxing Day, and although many places can only have 10 people indoors, residents are excited to get back to their usual routines. Over at Michael's Hair Design, Darlene Morissette was getting a long overdue haircut. She says she is taking the necessary precautions, but she has no worries about entering the salon. Well, it's super clean. It's super clean. I don't think they could take uh, any more cautions than they are at the moment. It's, it's pretty pretty uh, spotless in here. Retail shoppers can browse through racks and shelves in person again with our region in the red level. And J.B. Evans Fashion and Footwear has outlined social distancing rules across the store so that customers like Sherry Foglin don't feel at risk. I feel great. It's just nice to get out and support local. Oh, I feel safe. But the reopenings were short-lived. The province pulled the emergency break for the Thunder Bay District less than two weeks later, as local case counts started to skyrocket. Also in February, the sentencing hearing was held for Braden Bushby, the young man found guilty of manslaughter in the trailer hitch death of Barbara Kentner. Kentner's sisters Melissa and Connie wrote in their joint statement that they both suffer from stress, anxiety and depression as a result of their sister's death. Kentner's other sister Cheryl wrote her letter directly to Bushby saying that one day she will find a way to forgive him but that day is not today. Right now the only thing that brings her comfort is knowing that Bushby's life will be very difficult moving forward and that to Bushby Barbara may have just been another Indian but to her she was a light in the darkness. Bushby then took the podium and addressed the court for the first time during his trial. Bushby stated, I accept all responsibility for my actions. She did not deserve what happened to her. I'm very truly sorry for my actions. Whatever the sentence is, I will carry the guilt for the rest of my life. I hope to use this time in custody to become a better person. In March, City Council made a controversial decision voting against awarding the contract to build a new indoor turf sports facility at Chapels Park. But ultimately, Council couldn't get over the sticker shock. The cost of the tender had risen to more than $39 million, and the city would have had to borrow money to pay for it, meaning residents would have been on the hook for nearly $46 million after interest on a 25-year loan. That was too much even for councillors Kristen Oliver and Albert Aiello, who had both previously supported the project. My level of risk was, you know, to 33 million and now we're past that. And I was very clear with the people that phoned me back in the summertime in opposition to this that I wouldn't go over, I wouldn't go one dollar over budget. I'm just not comfortable with that amount. Once the project starts um, and if it balloons, uh, they're really... Um, can get a lot worse and a lot higher than that. Unfortunately, this project has really polarized the community. It's been it's been really discouraging to see that happen. Councillors voted seven to five not to award the contract. And while that's a major blow to the project, it's not officially dead yet. Dr. Janet DeMille had her hands full in early March as COVID case counts reached new heights in the Thunder Bay District. 60 cases were resolved, dropping the active case count to 458. Thunder Bay Regional announced a drop of seven COVID-19 patients to 44. 13 of those are in the intensive care unit. Dr. Janet DeMille released a video to the community on Monday night to address the growing case counts. She tells us the recent surge is being fueled largely by people continuing to interact with others. It's spreading within families and those you know, each, each family member could be spreading it further in various different ways, including their workplace or what we saw in the schools, for example. Local schools had been closed to in-class learning as of March 1st, and on March 24th, that closure was extended again. Lakehead Board Superintendent A.J. Keene says he has heard both negative and positive on the decision to keep kids out of class for a few more weeks, but he believes the Medical Officer of Health made the right call. 
We have heard from both staff and families that uh, they appreciate the decision that Dr. DeMille made that um, will uh, you know, help prevent the spread of trans or the transmission of the virus in our schools. The Catholic School Board in a statement recognized the importance for children to have in-class learning for the students' mental health and well-being, but understand the importance to keep students and families safe. While active cases in the district have fallen below 300 for the first time since late February, Dr. Janet DeMille notes many of the cases over the past month have involved kids. We see uh, school-aged children still getting COVID, and it's a fairly um, elevated number, and it just reflects uh, uh, what's happening in our community. Uh, we know for the last month um, there's been well over 110 cases uh, of school-aged children. Fortunately, COVID cases started to drop in April, and local pharmacies got the green light to start offering the vaccine. Those stories and more coming up as TBT News Year in Review continues. Welcome back to TBT News Year in Review. The month of April saw the arrival of the AstraZeneca vaccine at local pharmacies. I know it doesn't, the vaccine doesn't make you not get COVID, but the idea of not ending up in the hospital is really awesome. Perry got her dose of the AstraZeneca vaccine at the Shoppers Drug Mart on Red River Road. That large location was given 500 doses for its first shipment. The Oak Pharmacy on Arthur Street and Dawson Heights Pharmacy each received 200 doses. Shoppers pharmacist Maggie Wilmore says they plan on administering 120 to 140 doses per day with the goal of doing it as quickly as possible. Really it's about working as a team, so pharmacies, hospitals, um, the health unit distributed as much as possible. Also in April, the planned severing of the Northern Ontario School of Medicine from Lakehead and Laurentian Universities caused some hard feelings at LU. A terrible, hastily made decision. LU President Moira McPherson had harsh words to describe the government proposal to sever ties between NAWSM and Laurentian and Lakehead Universities. This is her letter sent to Ontario's Minister of Colleges and Universities, which mainly takes issue with the lack of consultation from the province. But McPherson also notes, we have not received confirmation that a NAWSM campus will continue to serve the community or even be located in northwestern Ontario. NAWSM President Dr. Sarita Verma accuses McPherson of fear-mongering. We're not leaving Thunder Bay. I don't know where Dr. McPherson and Lakehead began that rumor, but it's spreading fear and panic, and it's hurting psychologically and mentally and health-wise the perception that people have of a fantastic school. And there was also hard feelings from local officials when OPG announced in April that it had sold the idle Thunder Bay generating station on Mission Island to a demolition company. You know, it's not the result we were looking for. Thunder Bay Mayor Bill Morrow wasn't the only city official disappointed with Wednesday's announcement. Morrow and CEDC head Eric Zakruski were both hoping for more of a repurposing facility approach rather than a complete demolition. Obviously, we're concerned. We're, we're disappointed. We've been, you know, I first met with their senior leadership a couple of years ago, at least. And um, we expressed our thoughts on the property. We expressed our hopes. They've gone ahead and, and done what we would consider as the worst case scenario for the city of Thunder Bay. Um, they've hired, they've sold the plant and all the associated liabilities to a third party. Despite the opposition, the demolition of the power plant and the separation of NAWSM from LU both went ahead. In May, the city had its first homicide of 2021. Thunder Bay police have confirmed that 18-year-old Liam Slipperjack died of injury sustained in an assault early Friday morning in the area of Limbrick Street and Redwood Avenue. Two suspects are now in custody for homicide. 18-year-old Desmond Jarrell Kuekapa was originally charged with aggravated assault, but that's now been upgraded to second-degree murder. A 17-year-old male who cannot be named was taken into custody Monday morning and is also facing second-degree murder charges. The local Alstom plant got some good news in May as Ottawa and the province confirmed a long-awaited contract of 60 streetcars for the TTC. This deal will also help protect good, middle-class jobs at the Alstom Automotive Plant in Thunder Bay. Even though it isn't an automotive plant, Justin Trudeau is right about the fact that the announcement of a $12 billion investment in Toronto public transit will have a positive impact for workers in Thunder Bay. 
Dominic Pascalino is the president for the local Unifor 1075, which represents the Alstom plant here in Thunder Bay. He said he was pleasantly surprised to hear the Prime Minister specifically mention the plant, and he says the future for the Thunder Bay plant is brighter than it has been in quite some time. I can say that my optimism for the plant at this point has been the highest it's been in the last three years. And at the end of May, people across Canada and here in Thunder Bay were shocked and heartbroken by the discovery of a mass burial site of residential school children in Kamloops, B.C. Two local memorial ceremonies were held, one outside the underground gym and another one at a local residential school site. I'm a student, a residential school survivor. I was here in 1969, 70. I was here. Emotions ran high today as dozens gathered to pay their respects to the 215 victims found in BC. Here on the site of the former St. Joseph Indian Residential School, a sacred fire was lit, speeches were delivered, and a ceremonial song was sung as attendees wore orange shirts to honor the lives lost. 215 pairs of shoes were hung to symbolize the number of children discovered in the tragedy. Attendees were also encouraged to say a prayer and make an offering to the sacred fire. You know, our lives matter too. Ground lives matter too. Fort William Chief Peter Collins says the discovery of the children is a stark reminder of what the Indigenous community has been through and that accountability needs to be taken. Last week when they found these bodies in Kamloops, and you know, that's another black eye to Canada. You know, when people in this country continue to say, why is, the, why is it that you're, you're harping on, uh, on the residential school yet today? Well, this is why, because we still haven't found all the young people that went into those facilities. NAN Grand Chief Alvin Fiddler says he believes Canada is moving the opposite way from reconciliation. He believes more work needs to be done, but was pleased by the support and turnout at the event. I think this speaks to how many people have been impacted by this, not just Indigenous people, not just survivors of Indigenous schools or the families, but it's everyone. Uh, you know, it is such a, a profound, you know, I think all of us just have a profound sense of loss. When we come back, frustration grows over COVID lockdown measures as TBT News Year in Review continues. Welcome back. The month of June began with some discouraging news for many school kids, parents and teachers when the Ford government decided to continue online learning for the rest of the school year. I think by and large our children have been completely ignored throughout this pandemic. It was only a week ago Premier Doug Ford reached out to school officials, unions and medical experts on a plan to safely reopen schools for the final month of the academic year. Across the province, many advocated for a regional reopening approach, something that did not come to fruition. We're disappointed and uh, we had hoped that given our numbers here in Thunder Bay in particular, that uh, we would be uh, candidates for a regional situation. Very disappointed and a little bit disheartened that, uh, that the schools weren't open. We were hopeful that we would at least uh, get to a situation where we could reopen the schools for the last three weeks, uh, put a positive end to, uh, to the school year for our children and our staff. The feeling is mutual among local public teachers unions. Throughout the pandemic, Education Minister Stephen Lecce has preached schools are safe, but the decision to keep schools closed until the fall says otherwise. A whole lot of frustration right now, and I certainly feel for these kids. And I, I wish the province would start doing something to look out for our children and not just the adults in this province. When you look at our numbers, as much as we've had the, the Greenstone spike lately, I mean, in the city of Thunder Bay, I think things have been fairly stable, fairly low. For the duration of the pandemic, students have been in the classroom for only five months and even less in Thunder Bay. The time away has taken a serious toll on the mental health for students and the two directors of education say even just a few weeks back in the classroom to end the year would have gone a long way. It's been a very difficult year, but just to get together to socially interact with your peers and, and their teachers would have been extremely positive of, as we got into the, the end of this school year. And we need to do something to help these folks out. And just announcing that we're throwing some money at it, well... Online mental health supports is not the answer when the online factor is the big source of the mental health crisis. 
As far as the Premier's announcements regarding potential outdoor graduation, all parties admit that news caught them a bit off guard. But they look forward to more direction and clarity from the province in the coming days on how a potential outdoor graduation would look for not only grade 8s and 12s, but all students. Some local hair salon owners were also fed up with the Ford government's COVID decisions and chose to defy the lockdown orders on June 3rd. Rebel Barbers on North Edward Street is living up to its name and has opened its door to customers. The owner, who declined an on-camera interview, believes that his business has been shuttered for far too long and decided to take a stand. He went on to say that the health unit has given him an $880 fine that would be waived if he closed once again. District Medical Officer of Health Janet DeMille says she sympathizes with the personal care industry. I know that there are you know, many businesses that have suffered a lot because and lost a lot because of this pandemic and right from the beginning, right, with all the closures and the limitations. And I can appreciate the frustration of that. At least four salons received fines, but they were later waived by the health unit. On June 7th, a controversial homicide case finally came to an end. Braden Bushby walked into the Thunder Bay courthouse to finally learn his punishment more than four years after he threw a trailer hitch from a moving vehicle at two women walking down the street. That heavy object struck Barbara Kentner and the injuries eventually led to her death. Justice Pierce sentenced Braden Bushby to eight years in prison on the count of manslaughter with one month already served, saying he treated Barbara and Melissa Kentner as if they were disposable that January night. She came to the conclusion that Bushby did not target the Kentners because they were indigenous, but rather because they were women, as he looked to target sex workers that night. You believe that the sentence sends the right message to the public? Uh, I, I, I would believe that more if I could be convinced that Mr. Bushby planned an attack on women. I, I don't think that was the case. Uh, uh, clearly, he planned an attack, or he, he did an attack. I can't see that it was planned. Barbara Kentner's passed away. She's, she's died, and uh, there is no sentence that can bring her back. At, at the end of the day, from a, from a legal perspective, we have to look at the judgment. We'll take some time to, to review it, but the eight-year sentence is within the uh, 8 to 12 range that we suggested was an appropriate uh, sentence. The trial has seen multiple delays, and with a manslaughter charge finally added to aggravated assault, the family says they can get some closure. And while the judge pointed to the maturation of Bushby as a new father in her decision, there has also been a change in the way the Kentner's family members have felt over the situation. I feel sorry for him. Um, I didn't, at, um, at the beginning I was angry, very angry. And I feel sorry that he's ruined his life. Like he's taken our, my cousin, <clears throat> but he's also ruined his life. And I feel bad for <clears throat> him and his family. While the family didn't have a stance on the length of time given by Justice Pierce, Kentner's sister Connie was pleased that the judge mentioned the countless instances where indigenous people have had items thrown at them while in public, something she hopes can change. She actually acknowledged what, what is really going on around here and not even only around here, all over the place, right? Because we all get the same sort of treatment. Just hours after his sentencing hearing came to a close, Bushby's lawyers launched an appeal seeking bail as he looks to get his manslaughter conviction overturned. His motion for release was dismissed and he will await the appeal court's decision in custody. On June 29th, the city saw its second murder of the year. 31-year-old Dustin Dennis Mofat was charged with second-degree murder for the stabbing death of 17-year-old Cody Furioso near the James Street underpass. Uh, there were two injured parties discovered. Uh, they were transported uh, to Thunder Bay Regional Health Sciences Center. Subsequently, uh, one party has succumbed to his injuries. Uh, in a, uh, a course of the investigation, in the course of examining the area, uh, a male was located, identified, and was arrested on some outstanding warrants unrelated to this incident. The investigation progressed and identified th that male as the suspect in this incident. He has since been arrested and charged. 
The month of July saw numerous forest fires break out around the northwest, causing thick smoke in the air and several evacuations. They continued to arrive throughout the day Monday, approximately 400 evacuees from Poplar Hill First Nation, 125 kilometers north of Red Lake, and Deer Lake First Nation, about 60 kilometers further north, fleeing out-of-control wildfires in that area. Red Lake uh, 65 is uh, currently 4,012 hectares, and it is located approximately 16 kilometers southwest of Poplar Hill First Nation. The number of deaths from fentanyl and other toxic drugs spiked in July. First responders were called to 36 suspected overdoses, of which 14 turned out to be fatal. And city police issued a dire warning to the public. Get some help. The problem with the fentanyl is it takes a very, very small amount. Uh, a nanogram is about the size of a sugar uh, crystal, and three of those can be fatal. So, And we're seeing overdoses in the hundreds. So uh, the message is, please go try to get some help. There's lots of social groups that will assist. You can call 911. We're here to help first, and then we'll deal with the drugs after. Time now for another short break. When we come back, the month of August saw the retirement of our longtime news anchor, Barry Third. Welcome back. The month of August saw the long-awaited reopening of the Canada-U.S. land border, but only on the Canadian side, as American visitors were welcomed back to the Northwest. Despite the wait time seen at the Fort Francis border, the Pigeon River border is doing just fine. Many Americans are crossing, coming up to hunt, fish, and do other recreational activities. To many, this is an amazing escape. And we're very excited to, to get up here again. It's almost two years for us, but uh, we're, we're anxious to get back and just, I think uh, Bill, our partner, said, just to, to relax a little bit and just enjoy our fishing trip. Pigeon River officials reported mainly slow traffic volumes throughout the opening morning. On August 16th, the Thunder Bay Airport was the site of a tragic plane crash. Area pilot, 30-year-old Peter Belotis, died when his plane encountered problems just after takeoff and crashed on the runway. Just after 9 o'clock Monday night, residents around the Thunder Bay Airport heard a loud bang and were able to see flames and thick smoke on the tarmac. The plane was a Rockwell Commander 690B, owned by MAG Aerospace, similar to this one. It had just taken off and was bound for Dryden, where it's used as a bird dog for battling forest fires. Spokesperson for the Transportation Safety Board, Chris Krepsky, outlines what happened. There was a Rockwell Commander 690B, operated by MAG Aero, that departed from Thunder Bay, Ontario, on a flight to Dryden, Ontario. Uh, the aircraft departed on runway 12 at Thunder Bay. While returning to land on runway 07 at Thunder Bay, the aircraft lost control and struck the runway surface. Soon after the crash occurred Monday night, emergency crews rushed to the scene and put out the fire. The pilot, who has not yet been identified, was confirmed dead soon afterwards. TSB investigators from Winnipeg arrived Tuesday afternoon and will be conducting a very thorough probe of the crash scene and what's left of the aircraft. They're going to uh, examine the aircraft records, survey the uh, area where the occurrence took place. They'll also be looking to interview any witnesses to the occurrence. Um, gather some more information about uh, communications with air traffic control, uh, what the weather uh, would have been like at the time. Uh, and they'll also, when they're looking at the records of the aircraft, look at uh, if there's any components that we want to take a closer look at at the engineering lab in Ottawa. Smaller planes were back moving again on the airport tarmac on Tuesday morning, but it appears at least one of the runways is closed due to the location of the crash scene. Flights involving larger aircraft were being delayed or cancelled as passengers scramble to rebook or switch to smaller airlines for their travel. At the end of August, TBT News said goodbye to longtime news director and 6 o'clock anchor Barry Third, who retired after 41 years at the TV station. A special farewell newscast featured lookbacks at Barry's long career as the trusted voice for the region, and he had a heartfelt message for his loyal viewers. I've often said that being invited to your home every evening was an honor, and it's one I tried hard to treat with care and respect. I hope you feel that we've done that. I'm going to miss joining you for supper every night. Thank you for the opportunity. It's been a real privilege. Best wishes to you all, and hopefully we'll see you again sometime soon. So 
So long for now. And yes, we still miss you around here, Barry. In September, Thunder Bay residents said goodbye to a much different local landmark as the huge smokestack at the former Thunder Bay generating station was brought down with an implosion. Four, three, two, one, fire. Right on schedule at 9 a.m., the giant smokestack that helped supply coal-fired power to the city for more than 40 years came crashing down on Mission Island. It took about 15 seconds to be reduced to rubble and dust. Budget demolition site manager Jeremy Later says they aimed for it to fall towards the sleeping giant. Yeah, it went 100% as planned. All the modeling was exactly what we expected. So yeah, we can't be any happier than how it, uh, how it happened. Also in September, Thunder Bay saw its first major concert event since the pandemic began, as nearly 4,000 people attended the Wake the Giant Music Festival. The Wake the Giant Music Festival was put on once again, with the goal of creating a more inclusive city, but also to welcome hundreds of Indigenous youth who attend school from remote communities into the city. The kids of Dennis Franklin Camardi attended events over the three days leading up to the concert, where they got VIP passes, got to throw balloons into the crowd, and even got to go up on stage. We talked to one DFC student, Lewis Chapman, on what the event means for the students. I guess the whole game plan of this event is to try to like bring all, all communities, you know, all, all, all um, races, I guess you could say, together to form unity. Do you think it's working? I think so. On September 20th, Canadians elected a new parliament, but things remained pretty much the same as Marcus Pulowski was re-elected in Thunder Bay Rainy River. There's your winner, folks. It was another big win for Marcus Pulowski, winning his second term as MP for the Thunder Bay Rainy River riding. After a whirlwind night that saw several lead changes, the Liberal incumbent finished with just over 13,000 votes. Conservative Adelina Pekia and the NDP's Yuk Sem Wan both finished around 2,000 votes behind Pulowski. The PPC made a strong push to take fourth place, while the Greens lost over 1,000 votes to land in fifth. After the final result became apparent, Pulowski was extremely relieved. I'm happy! <laughs> I won. <laughs> I think the, the final numbers weren't that different. A little closer than last time, but um, in, the, in the end, I think we, we pulled off a fairly decent win, but, but, but it was certainly nerve-wracking. For Pekia's first time running, she was happy with her close second-place finish, along with the efforts and hard work she and her team put into this campaign. She says it was both a good fight and a really positive experience. And with the next election looming any time due to the minority government, Pekia is already looking towards running again. Yes, I would. Yeah, I, at this point, I think so. You know, it's, it's, um, I've learned so much. Like I said, I know exactly what to do next time. Not that I wasn't prepared this time, but uh, I would be more prepared next time. The NDP's Yuk Sem Wan also said she's open to running again. And even though she finished with the same third place result she had in 2019, she felt hope coming out of this election rather than disappointment. We're still strong, we're still there. The support that we received from, from volunteers, from donors, uh, and right across the region was amazing. Uh, it, it kept me inspired and motivated, my whole team, and I think we really, uh, you know, we showed that there's still hope uh, for change. Although Pulowski was happy with the outcome of this election, he wants a better result next time. I have to say it's a little frustrating that I think I've done a really good job. <laughs> and, and for, for, for so many of my constituents and to end up basically the same place, I, I have to admit, was a little frustrating. Um, but, but so be it, you know, and, and congratulations to my opponents and the fact that they, they, they did so well. So. And Minister Patty Haidu cruised to another easy victory in her riding. It was a celebratory atmosphere at the election party for Patty Haidu as she took home nearly 17,000 votes this time around. That was over 5,000 more than her nearest challenger, NDP candidate Chantel Bryson. Conservative Joshua Taylor finished close behind Bryson in third. The Green Party dropped nearly 3,000 votes and finished fifth behind PPC's Rick Danes.
Haidu says the vote results show her that people in the region support the work she's done since 2015. Just a real a sense of joy. We had a really good campaign. We felt good out there and we had great conversations with people at the door, uh, on the phone. And, um, you know, this is just an affirmation that the region wants me to continue to represent them. As for Bryson, she was pleased with her vote total. But despite that, she is unsure whether she'll run again. Instead, leaning towards continuing her battles against the Liberal Party in the courtroom. We were happy to see our numbers go up from the last two races and certainly the public reception was wonderful. Um, so we're very proud of that, of what we could do in six weeks during the summer of a pandemic. I may just stick to the law, that's what I do. And I will fight Justin Trudeau and Patty Heidi that way for what they're doing in this riding. Conservative Joshua Taylor was among friends and family at home during election night. And the 28-year-old says he looks forward to learning from this experience to be an even stronger candidate next time around. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It was a learning experience. And uh, obviously, congratulations uh, to Patty if that's how the votes end up coming in when they're all counted. And uh, we'll be back stronger. We'll regroup and uh, do even better next time. So we'll be more formidable going forward. During her election night speech, Haidu added how thrilled she is to continue serving as an inspiration to the next generation. You know, one of the biggest privileges for me as the first elected member of parliament for this riding, who's a female, is the number of young girls that gasp when I come to their door. And all I see is a future leader. Because God damn it, Jacqueline, we are going to have a female prime minister one day, one way or another. <laughs> Time now for another short break. When we come back, Thunder Bay sees three more shocking murders in October and November as TBT News Year in Review continues. The arrival of fall in Thunder Bay brought several new homicide cases as three suspicious deaths were investigated. One of them involved a home explosion on October 7th in the West Fort Village. The force of the explosion knocked the bricks right off this home's outside walls on Sunday evening. Police and fire crews later found the sole occupant deceased inside, and the home is now considered a murder scene. We went down to an investigation regarding fire, possible explosion at 147 uh, Frederica Street. As a result of the investigation, uh, we uh, came across a person that was unfortunately deceased within there, and since then we've been working uh, with several agencies, and as such we can now declare this a homicide. The family of the victim, 32-year-old Jordan LaPointe, put up signs on the damaged home calling for justice. And over several days in late October, city police announced the arrest of a total of four people implicated in the case. Another homicide occurred on October 17th on the other side of the city. This was the scene on Park Avenue today, less than 24 hours after a 36-year-old Thunder Bay man was stabbed in the city's north side. Paramedics transported the victim to the Thunder Bay Regional Health Sciences Center for further evaluation, where he was later pronounced deceased. Khalid Ali Mohammed, a 25-year-old male from Toronto, has been arrested and charged with first-degree murder. On October 25th, Patty Haidu was given a new role. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau switched her portfolio from Health Minister to Minister of Indigenous Services and Minister Responsible for FedNor. I, Patricia Haidu, do solemnly and sincerely promise and declare that I will truly and faithfully and to the best of my skill and knowledge execute the powers and trust reposed in me as Minister of Indigenous Services and Minister Responsible for the Federal Economic Development Agency for Northern Ontario. Meanwhile, Provincial MPP Michael Gravel found himself in hot water with his Liberal Party leader twice. It was revealed that emails were sent to the Premier's office seeking advice to help an area health care worker employed who had refused to get vaccinated. This latest email with an attachment from a concerned constituent was sent to government officials two days after Gravel's first apology. He says it was accidentally sent by one of his staff members. Fortunately, um, as a result of some miscommunication, um, other emails got sent out afterwards, and I apologize for that. I have wonderful staff, and I'm very grateful for the hard work they do for me, but, but a mistake was made, and uh, it's been corrected, and I can assure you it will never happen again. 
In early November, the police association went public with a highly critical letter targeting Chief Sylvie Hoth, the police board and the force's senior management. A survey of over 300 officers found low morale and a lack of faith in the leadership team. We conducted the survey earlier on this year. Uh, we brought those results to the police service uh, senior administration. We brought it to the police services board in the hopes of um, engaging in conversation and create some positive change in the police service. Uh, you know, we can tell them all day long what the issues are. They're the ones in power to make those changes happen. Uh, and nothing has happened at this point that's, in my members' eyes, have uh, made our workplace better. So. That was followed by a series of human rights complaints filed against police leadership, first by police board member George Ann Morriso, and then by a pair of officers who claimed they were unfairly targeted with police act investigations. Meanwhile, city police were dealing with another homicide in West Fort, this time at a low-income apartment complex. The murder investigation continues on Amelia Street after police found a 31-year-old man shot to death in a second-floor apartment at Spence Court. Social media posts by family members have confirmed the victim's identity as Conrad Bannon. No arrests have been made yet, and police had few details to share about the murder. We are concerned regarding the gun violence within the city. We've had five homicides this year, three attempts. Within the last month, we've had three homicides and two attempts. The night sky was lit up in November when a huge fire broke out at the former Great West Timber. It was the second major blaze on the abandoned site following a similar fire in 2015. The building last night, um, other than I, I believe one exterior structure wall is, is basically completely engulfed uh, and just the interior contents are now um, what's left smoldering in there. The fire is believed to have scorched the former planing mill, a roughly 300 foot long structure which Paxton says was full of flammable items. Grease, uh, oils, obviously sawdust, some, some product that might have been left behind in there stored and bundled. Um, and when you have product that's tightly bundled like that, it does take a while to get to get inside it, um, to get the water penetrating far enough to stop stop it from continuing to, to light up again. And in late November, the vaccine was made available to children aged 5 to 11. And it couldn't come soon enough, as rising COVID cases were starting to impact many local schools. Well, I think it's great uh, if it helps us to move past COVID and prevent the spread, absolutely supportive. Um, we're really excited that the kids could get vaccinated now. It could help protect their younger siblings who can't get vaccinated yet. Um, I'm scared of them too, except once it went into my arm, it wasn't bad. In late November, local residents were finally able to travel to the U.S. for short trips without needing an expensive PCR test to return to Canada. But on December 2nd, Dr. Janet DeMille issued a warning about traveling to neighboring U.S. states. The CDC has indicated that there is high, has ranked them as high community transmission, literally in all the counties of those, of those three states. And that does include the counties that are right next to our, the international border that's close to us. DeMille is most worried about Minnesota, noting that it's the most frequent travel destination for locals venturing into the United States but she says they've already seen proof that backs their worries about more cross-border travel. We've also had some recent cases that acquired, in our area, that acquired the virus uh, in those states and brought it back here, and then we saw a little bit of spread from them. And on December 6th, Thunder Bay Regional and 11 other hospitals in the Northwest announced mandatory vaccinations for all staff and volunteers by January. We recognize the severe health effects related to COVID-19. So in order to protect both our organizations, our hospitals, our communities, the integrity of our health services, we felt that it was incredibly important to move together. Employees who fail to receive their vaccination before the posted dates will either have to resign or be placed on leave until they're terminated for cause. 96.3% of regional staff are fully vaccinated. The CEO says they expect to reach close to 99 after the mandate. The hospitals that have moved to mandatory vaccine have seen about 1% to 1.5% of staff not, um, not uh, adhere to mandatory vaccine orders. So essentially that means that 
they're they're losing for us that would mean we would lose maybe 25 staff and now as the new year arrives local residents are hoping 2022 will finally see covid brought under control and life returning to normal only time will tell and tbt news will continue bringing you the latest on the pandemic and other major news events in the year ahead but for now, thanks for joining us for this recap of the top stories of 2021.